and welcome to The Sacred. My name is Elizabeth Oldfield, and this is a podcast about our deepest values, the stories that shape us, and how we can grow in empathy and understanding about the people who are not at all like us. I think it's really important, actually, to be honest about the way that everyone has allergies. Everyone has political positions or job titles or genders or races or names or just associations that when we see them in a list of podcast episodes, we're just more likely to scroll on by thinking, that's not for me. I don't particularly want to listen to that person today. We have people and groups and names and political positions and other types of identities that we feel warm towards naturally. And we think, yeah, I'd like to listen to that person today. And this is partly because it's just lovely to listen to someone who says things we already think, but says them better. It's just so affirming. However, we're mainly using technologies in ways that makes this listening to people we already agree with incredibly easy and listening to people who are different from us much harder. And these technologies, these changes in information technology are on top of demographic trends known as the big sort which means we're less likely to encounter people from different backgrounds, races, classes, and beliefs in our everyday lives also. And the less we do it, the less we can tolerate it. The more easily we find ourselves annoyed, the more easily we get triggered into a fight or flight response, a threat response, just because someone might believe something different from us or look different from us or sound different from us. And the more we let that reaction become a habit or an established neural pathway, the easier it is to believe that those kind of people are a them, a group, a a tribe that we're not part of, and maybe even that they are not fully human, precious and valuable. And I have problems with these trends theologically when I find them in myself. I have problems with them sociologically given the depth of the problems we are facing globally, Um, nationally as human beings. And so this is a podcast about trying to connect with complicated human beings. Yes, it's an interview. It's a conversation. I'm just trying to get to know people, but I'm hopefully trying to do it with a broader range of people than you might normally expect. Some of our guests come with strong tribal signifiers or strong opinions, but I want to connect with them not on a level of debate, but on a level of encounter. In this episode, you'll hear an interview with Professor Francesca Stavrakopoulou, Francesca is Professor of Hebrew Bible and Ancient Religion at the University of Exeter. She got her doctorate from Oxford and has presented on BBC television. She's the author of many academic monographs and her most recent popular book is God and Anatomy. She's also patron of Humist UK. We spoke about her vegetarianism, growing up in a single parent household without a lot of money, going to Oxford to study theology as an atheist and some of the abuse she gets as a woman in public life. As usual, there are some reflections from me at the end and they're more personal than usual, um, which I'm a bit nervous about, but I hope you enjoy them and I hope you enjoy listening. Francesca, I am going to start with asking you something that we don't get asked every day on the bus or, you know, in an interview usually, which is about what is sacred to you. But I want to frame it so it's very clear it is not necessarily religious Um, that it can be a value or a principle that you've tried to live by. And I'm very comfortable with people rejecting the premise of the question, taking it in a different direction, um, really just thinking out loud for me about what bubbled up in response to it. What might be sacred? What is a sacred value for you? It is such an interesting question um, because when I hear the word sacred, given what I do for a living. Um, you know, I spend a lot of my intellectual life in the past, <laughs> um, in ancient religions and practices um, and different cultural contexts. And in that ancient world, when something sacred, it is something that is set apart. It's distinct from the ordinary um, or the human in some ways. And so when I think, you know, w- what is it that's that's set apart for me? What is the thing around which I try to build certain sorts of boundaries and parameters and prize? I have to say, I think it's, as I've got older, particularly in the last sort of 10 years or so, I've come to realise that what's particularly prized and sacred to me is the notion of non-human personhood. 
So the notion that um, humans, yes, we are extraordinary in all sorts of ways, um, but we are not so different from other living things. And I mean, personally, I'm a vegetarian and it wasn't a decision, you know, I wasn't raised as, as a vegetarian. It, it's something, it's a decision that I came to about sort of 20 years ago. Um, don't get me wrong. I love the taste of meat. Um, I, I used to really enjoy it, but I just became increasingly uncomfortable with the idea of eating animals, particularly in this very economically privileged Western culture that I live in, in which we do have a huge economic um, and social choice about what we eat and how we produce food. Um, and so I think in that sense, on the one hand, you know, we've really just commodified animals extraordinarily. I mean, they are no longer living beings in our society. You know, they are creatures that are born to be killed in order for us to eat. Um, and I have a real problem with that. This mass production and commodification and consumption of other living beings. And I think we tend to overplay our exceptionalism within the grand scheme of things. And it's something that, you know, people are talking about much more, particularly, you know, with the climate crisis, um, the climate emergency. I think particularly younger generations are taking that a lot more seriously and recognising the impact that we have as individuals as well as whole communities on, on the planet and on our ecosystems. Um, but for those of us that are privileged enough to live in a society in which we can eat well um, and eat relatively inexpensively, by not eating animals, but eating other sorts of foods. I think we have a responsibility to do that so that those people who live in contexts in which there isn't as much choice about what they eat, um, you know, it, it's almost kind of like trying to offset that as much as possible. And so, yeah, animals' well-being and their personhood is, is something that I feel very strongly about. That's really helpful, what you said about building boundaries around and set apartness, because I've spoken to more than 100 people now and I'm still sort of refining what I mean by sacred. It came originally for me from an anthropologist called Scott Atran, who talked mm. about sacred values in conflict. And then I kind of backfilled by reading Durkheim and the sort of original stuff about the sacred as a kind of gather, a gathering point for communities, a kind of, you know, place for collective effervescence. But you've given me a sort of adjacent and new way of thinking about it. Like, what would I what would I guard? What would I seek um, to protect? I would love to hear more about your childhood. What was the kind of, I guess, the feel of your childhood? That's a ridiculous thing to try and condense into a sentence. But I'm particularly interested if there are any big ideas that were formative, religious, political, philosophical, that you think have helped make you the woman you are today? Um, yeah, the woman I am today, because gender, um, what it is to be, to not be a man, I think was a very... I was very aware of that from a very early age. My father wasn't in my life for a long, 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 long time um, for various complicated reasons. So I grew up in England with my mum, who's English. Uh, when we came back from Greece, um, we, we initially lived uh, with her mother in Bexley. And then when I was about 18 months old, we moved. Um, my mum got a job and with the job came this little flat. And so we lived in this little tiny flat, um, pretty much on Chiswick Roundabout in West London, um, we had to be rehomed, uh, rehoused by the council because that, I mean, it was pretty terrible. And, you know, it would rain and the rainwater would run down through the walls. We lived, you know, without electricity in certain rooms for long periods of time. And it wasn't an economically privileged upbringing. You know, it was single parent um, and we didn't have any money, basically. But because my mum was a single parent, my mum was going out to work all day, every day, um, which meant that I spent a lot of time understanding that it was not just difficult being a single parent, but I, I think I, I understood very early on that it's quite hard being a woman in a lot of ways, being a mother, but also being a, a woman in, in the workplace. Um, my mum worked for some very big companies, um, starting off temping um, in secretarial work and then, you know, worked her way up incredibly to become this really important sort of events manager and various other things so you know she did incredibly well but I saw how hard she worked um but as a result I also spent a lot of time with my English grandmother so I was pretty much you know brought up by these two very strong women um and I was really aware of the sort of wider dynamics of that I think um 
not living with a man in the house. I think that has shaped very much my sense of of the differences, the the, the differences that we're in, you know, that are enculturated in us um, in terms of gender and performativity, um, and the differences, the different ways in which we're socialised. And so I think that coupled with recognising that we didn't have the kind of lifestyle that some of the kids at my school had, um, just just because we didn't have any money. And, and I think recognising that also taught me very early on about the inequalities, I suppose, um, in society. I mean, by the time I went to secondary school, and my mum was really... Um, very um, ambitious for me in the sense that I think she knew that I was quite a bright kid. We spent a lot of time, you know, all of our weekends were spent, you know, we'd go to the public library every Saturday. We'd drop the washing off at the laundrette, go to the public library, pick up some library books, go back to the laundrette and sit reading our library books while we waited for the for the washing cycle and the drying cycle to finish. And um, so I think, you know, reading and talking about what we were reading had always been a really important part of my childhood. And so my mum knew, I, I think, that I was bright. And was really determined to give me a good education. So I went to a normal state school, primary school, you know, junior school. Um, and then she put me in for um, an exam to get into a private school. And I passed the exams um, and luckily won um, a bursary so that all my fees were paid and stuff. And that was great. But it also brought me into a world in which I was surrounded by... Um, people who were from incredibly wealthy backgrounds and I found that quite hard not because I was envious but because I just realized that our lifestyles were com completely different you know they were all going on skiing holidays and you know or, or riding horses and stuff at weekends and um and and it, it was just alien completely alien to me I didn't feel like I was missing out I was just very aware mm. of that difference I think and I think so that's really stayed with me and I think as teenagers, we're so tender, right? I don't think you'd find a teenager who doesn't in some ways feel like they don't belong or they don't fit in. Mm. But you have a kind of particular experience of it. How do you think that has belong or don't belong or need to belong or don't need to belong in your life now? Um, I think it really hit home when I went to university, particularly. I went to Oxford I applied to a college that was great for my subject area. I did a theology undergraduate degree. Um, I particularly chose it because it, it was the only post holder who was a woman, um, who was the theology tutor there. And that I was, I liked the sound of her. I, and she turned out to be absolutely fantastic. Professor Sue Gillingham, she's amazing. Um, but the college itself was put, I mean, we were talking about Oxford, right? <laughs> and then when I went in the nineties, it, it, you know, it wasn't as diverse as it might have it might appear to be a little more diverse today um but it certainly wasn't as diverse when i was there and but this college was particularly um was dominated by public school students um and so then again it was like just you know i know i was lucky because it was the days before tuition fees so you know i i got a grant a maintenance grant and and student loans and all the other sorts of things but you know i was again there was a sense in which I could see that people had an awful lot more money and so they were, you know, doing things that I just couldn't afford to do, whether it was going clubbing in London or Swindon or whether it was going off on these fancy holidays altogether. That's fine, I can cope with that. But what I really recognised when I was at Oxford was that sense of entitlement that comes with people who have had a very comfortable, not just a very comfortable economic life, but have been socially and culturally, but just been far more privileged. And they come from families that have for generations been far more privileged. And that's when I... And that pissed me off, actually. And I think that's um, because I saw how badly they treated people. So the people that would come and empty our rubbish bins in the mornings or would clean the, the student kitchens or, um, you know, the porters on the lodge, that they they treated them like a, a different class of people. But And I just found that appalling and, and infuriating. I started to build certain sorts of stereotypes and prejudices about those people. And I, and I recognised that. I was quite, um, almost become, became like an inverted snob in the sense that, you know, the way that somebody spoke. And I'm, I've, I've often been judged by the way I speak. I don't sound quite posh enough in some contexts or like learned enough. Um, but I, I, I recognised that I was starting to, if I met somebody new and, and they spoke incredibly well with that particular kind of 
privileged, wealthy British accent, I just thought, I'm not going to like you. And that was wrong of me. That that was wrong. But I, I think it was this kind of, it was this recognition that not just that the world isn't fair, but that actually with privilege comes this just an assu- this entitlement and this assumption. And I found that infuriating, like really infuriating. And I still do to a certain degree. So, you know, yeah. look at the, our government now, for example, is populated with people like that. And um, and I do think that underscores a huge amount of the damage that they've done to those who are not just less privileged in our society, but but those who are, you know, we need to talk about poor people, not just poverty. These are poor people um, who are relying on food banks and, and other sorts of measures because the people that are in power just... They they just have no idea. They they're not interested. They don't recognise that that you can't just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you know make a better life yourself when everything is stacked against you in a systemic structural way, and that infuriates me. I'm always interested in the divisions and the such good kind of self awareness. The sort of the prejudices that feel allowable in us mm. and how we both challenge our stereotypes of groups in order to see the, the like complicated human being in front of us who might be posh or black or gay or Tory or communist or whatever it is, mm. while still retaining the ability to be angry about <laughs> some things, you know? And though it feels like we slide so quickly from, I guess, just or useful challenge of systems to contempt for groups yeah. or contempt yeah. for t- types like are, are, are the like temptation to type people yeah. yeah feels so insidious to me but totally endemic and I think we're in a phase where that and I feel it in myself where that that one the like anti-posh prejudice or something <laughs> yeah feels legitimate yeah. because it's so close to systems and Political things. Anyway, that is a, 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 a rabbit hole. Maybe we'll come back to it. Um, before we get, because there was a particular experience that you had at Oxford, I think because of the subject you were studying and coming from a non-religious background. But I just want to hear a little bit, I guess, about how much the Greek part of your heritage did show up in your childhood and in your kind of worldview and your understanding of metaphysics. And then what led you to want to study theology mm. at Oxford mm. alongside having a great woman at the helm? Yeah, I mean, my Greek heritage, I mean, even though my dad wasn't in my childhood, um, you know, I absolutely knew who I was in terms of my heritage. My surname is, you know, ridiculously long surname. Um, and people, you know, do struggle with it. But, but you're, you're made to feel different have, when you're little, when you're a kid and you've got a surname like Savrakopoulou, you're made to feel very different anyway, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But, you know, so I was always, my, in, in that sense, my identity, even on paper, was very much bound up with my Greekness. Um, but in terms of the cultural stuff, I mean, we, you know, my mum had lived a long time in Greece, you know, so our home was filled with all sorts of Greek things. The Greek icons in particular, well, my mum's not religious. Um, my dad's not particularly religious, you know, theoretically Greek Orthodox, but, you know, he's much more inclined to believe, <laughs> to believe in Apollo and Poseidon um, than he is <laughs> in in the kind of, in the reality of this, the Western um, sort of Christianized construct of gods. Um, but yeah, my Greek heritage was important. I spent a lot of time, you know, like a lot of kids, I was really interested in ancient Greek and Roman myths and legends and gods and goddesses and ancient Egyptian stuff. And that was what I loved. And I spent a lot of time as a kid in museums um, my English grandmother moved to Oxford um, when I was little, just coincidentally. And so, you know, if I wasn't at home in London and going to museums with my mum, I was in Oxford, you know, spending time at the Pitt Rivers or the Ashmolean or whatever when I was little as well. So that was a really important part of, of my growing up. That was what we did because um, it was free <laughs> as well, but, you know, which helped. So that I was always really interested in it. And, I, and as I studied you know, we had to do religious studies at school, which I, you know, was a good thing. And I think, I think religious studies should be um, an absolutely crucial part of, of any secondary school syllabus. But I just got more and more interested in, you know, how come this Jesus guy is the only one from, you know, the ancient world? How come he was thought to be a, a God and yet a man? You know, like clearly 
he was just like my ancient Greek, you know, heroes who were like half human, half divine. Like, what makes this? Why? Why is he different? Why has this particular idea survived into the modern day and become so important? And yet, all my ancient world gods had disappeared. And I, so that's why I was really got interested in it when I was at school. And um, yeah, decided that I wanted to study theology because I wanted to find out about the origins of you know Christianity and Judaism in particular because I was quite interested in Bible stories. Um, you know, not from a, a religious point of view at all, but I was, you know, it was it was there as a part epic. of our cultural. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I just wanted to find out more about that, so I decided to do theology, and then, yeah, got to Oxford, and everybody else was on my course was religious, and and you know, and and my lecturers and tutors were religious. They were Christian mostly. Um, different flavours of Christianity. You know, I was taught by monks and nuns, as as well as you know by C of E people and lay readers and all sorts of things. And, and you know, not an issue with that at all. But there was always an assumption that we were all singing from the same hymn sheet in our personal lives. Um, you know, I remember being in one tutorial at Greyfriars College, um, which is sort of a monastic f- um, base. And a great, I mean, he was a great academic, um, Tom Wynandy. He was from New York. And we were talking about the kind of the philosophical platonic ideas that had gone into shaping early ideas about the Trinity, how God can be one and three. You know, we've been talking all this through. And, and I remember Tom Wynandy, my, my tutor, sort of saying, you know, isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? And then he said, I think we should pray. And it was me and this one other um, student. And I just thought, I yeah, so I, 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 and I said, well, tell you what, you guys can pray. I'm going to nip outside for a cigarette because that's the days when I smoked real cigarettes. So I went outside for a cigarette and just let them get on with it. But but I think that I remember that as being one of the first times that I actually had the confidence to say, hang on a minute, this is not, I, it was my way of saying this is not appropriate or, or, or don't, just don't impose or project this kind of assumption onto me. You know, and I, I'd made it clear before, I would say, you know, I'm not a Christian or whatever. Um but I think that was the first time I thought, Do you know what, I just want to remove myself from this particular situation because I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not interested in being put into a certain kind of pigeonhole just because I'm studying this material. You can study this material and these ideas and debate these ideas through sheer intellectual curiosity and because you want to better understand a the cultures that that we're in now, but also you know wh- where these ideas have come from. Like, and I and that that annoys me. Um, this idea about praying. You know, and I was told by tutorial partners, so fellow students, oh, you know, you're a Christian, you just don't know it yet. Um, or you're very spiritual for an atheist. I mean, what does that mean? You're very spiritual. What? They mean I'm a nice person. They, they kind of expect perhaps that atheists are all of a Dawkins type mould. And I mean, I think, I think Dawkins is, um, his atheism is not my atheism. And indeed, his understanding of what religion is, is not my understanding of what religion is. I, I think he misunderstands it to to a certain, a huge degree, actually. Um, but yeah, I, I so I'd, I'd, I'd had these assumptions put on me and that annoys me as well. You know, I was annoyed by the posh rich people and I was, I was annoyed by the, the religious people. It sounds like your tutors didn't navigate the diversity of sort of metaphysical positions particularly well with you, maybe to understate mm-hmm. it. You're now uh, in their position, you know, you're lecturing, you're um, teaching, you have this very, um, very impressive academic pedigree and these undergraduates show up in Exeter, presumably from a more diverse range of kind of understandings of God or whatever. They're there to study theology or biblical studies for a wider range of reasons, Mm. but I often think when we try and talk about spirituality or these very deep things, it's so hard to not come with them being extremely personally loaded. And it just raises the temperature a little bit in any situation. Like even preparing to speak to you, I was like, well, this woman is clearly smart. She's clearly lovely. I've listened to other podcasts with her. I've read her stuff. But knowing that your position on my best thing is not, you know, that you don't believe in God and I'm a Christian. I had to give myself a little talking to. I was like, you cl- you're clearly going to like her a lot. Like, just the, the, that, that, 
such a deep human defensiveness, right, around yeah. these differences that whether you're a, this lone yeah. atheist in a room of religious people or the lone Christian in a room of people who have negative associations with religion s- makes it really difficult to navigate. Pastorally, as a kind of educational leader, how do you navigate it? Because presumably you've got people losing their faith and finding faith and changing their minds and fighting and hating each other <laughs> all over the classroom. Mm. What do you do? How do you carry that? Uh, that burden or yeah. uh, do you have to just go I'm literally only responsible for the educational bit and I can't take on the weight of these young lives <laughs> oh my god um you know as I said we're like halfway through term at the minute I'm absolutely knackered it's been a really hard teaching term um and there are some times when I think wouldn't it be amazing if all we did was just look after the educational side of stuff and didn't need to worry about but you know we're human and our students are are people are human and you can't but help invest in them as people and you've all had such terrible like you've got presumably mental health crisis amongst the staff amongst the students and and you know in terms of mental health there is something peculiar that has been happening again for the last 10-15 years I mean our young people are really hurting and they're hurting before they get to us at university. That they're, they're, I think people are, young people seem to be really struggling in ways that that they they weren't necessarily before. So it's not just that they're able to articulate it and to and to be more open about the, the the struggles that they have with their mental health. But but things are not good. Things are not healthy in our education sectors at the moment. Um, but yeah, what do I do? The first thing I do is I kind of. And I'm very clear with my students. Um, the first thing I do is set certain sorts of, give them the context in which we are. In my lectures and my classes, these are the contexts in which we're operating. And we are operating in seeking to understand the ancient societies that gave rise to these texts that have become incredibly authoritative, not just in a spiritual or theological way, but in cultural ways too. You know, I often say the Bible is a cultural icon in the West, whether we believe it or not, whether, you know, whether it's an important text collection of text for us or not it is a cultural icon and has shaped and continues to shape an awful lot of the ways that we think about things and deal with things and respond to things um even a seemingly secular society one of the first things i emphasize is that you know i'm interested in where these texts came from the kinds of societies and groups that were producing them the sorts of things that they that they did and that's i think one of the big distinctions that's quite important and it you know, we, we're so accustomed when we're talking about religion and faith, whatever religion or faith in the modern day, we're so used to talking about belief, faith, belief, um, as if it's a cognitive thing, as if it's an intellectual thing. In lots of ways, I don't think that's the case in contemporary societies, but in ancient societies, you know, that, that idea of belief wasn't, it, it wasn't a live issue. You know, religion is what you do. It's not what you think or believe. It's it's a way of being in the world. Um just as, you know, certain sorts of the way, again, the ways that people are in, enculturated and socialised and how, how we are social beings. It, it's something that you do. It's not just kind of, it's not this internal kind of intellectual or cognitive dialogue that you have with yourself. And so, and I think in that sense, when I'm talking to students about these texts, these biblical texts, and for some of my students, these texts are sacred to them, are special to them. And for other students, these texts are just further examples of ancient literature and they're intrigued and curious and, and puzzled by them as, as we all are, as we should be. These are very difficult texts to, to, to wrestle with and to understand. But I, I think there's a sense in which I try to emphasise the social dynamics and cultural dynamics that are particular to, to these texts and the ways in which we shift um, our understandings of texts when we shift social and cultural context Mm. and so I think by sort of establishing those sorts of boundaries and so it's very rare that people ask me you know what you know are you are you Christian I think there's an assumption sometimes that because I'm teaching this stuff most people think they they might assume oh she's Jewish and then they quickly think oh no she must be Christian um no she must be Jew um Christian oh no she Greek Orthodox you know people get a bit muddled because they I think I don't necessarily fit into a box but actually there is much more diversity in in terms of the positions that students come with, depending on faith or non-faith. They're much more diverse. So as I was kind of reading about you and thinking about you, it's such a privilege, this job, because I just get to 
like feel my way into someone's world a bit, it felt like your the pub your, the, your kind of public profile is part. Well, the thing that I actually find it quite refreshing because it frustrates me when academics pretend they have no skin in the game at all, right? That they are <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, like full <laughs> academic objectivity. Me, believe anything? No, I just follow the facts. Um, or, you know, that I think that's changing. But certainly when I was studying, there was this sense in which like any I, any me, like any yeah. sense of myself in scholarly work was taboo, which I just think sort of suppressed it all and came out of these like passive aggressive <laughs> side swipes. <laughs> um, but you are a scholar of these texts who is publicly an atheist, has, you know, been involved in the British Humanist Association. I, can't, I The phrase I was reaching for was like more on the campaigning end. And then I was like, I actually don't know if that's true. Like I might have just assumed that because of the wider humanist stuff or not. But how has that changed in your career? How you think about how those things work together? Um, what is your sort of philosophy of the scholar and the, again, you can reject the word activist, but I can't think of a better one right now. You know, um, your public voice, I guess, and how you position mm. yourselves and how much you position yourself in your field. Yeah, I was taught, trained, um, both at school and at university, to take the eye out of out of academic work. So, you know, even writing an essay for tutor, you know, don't use the word me, don't use the word I, you know. So, and it is this this fallacy, this kind of fiction of thinking that you can be completely objective. Of course you can't. Um, and I didn't used to talk about my atheism. Um, I mean, I rarely talk about my atheism, at, you know, in lectures and, and stuff like that, because it's just not, it's, it's not about me, it's about the texts. Um, but it was only when I started doing stuff in the media that, you know, oh, I don't know some of the national newspapers had a big hoo-ha, say, oh, you know, the BBC have hired an atheist to present programmes about the Bible, you know, how terrible it is. And, you know, and that was when people sort of started asking me a bit more about, well, why are you an atheist? And a lot of people, both within my world, in the academic world and outside of it, assumed that I must have been originally religious and had lost my faith as a result of becoming a specialist, an academic specialist. And, you know, also all through your research, you discovered that it wasn't true. And that's not the case at all. I've, all. I've never been religious. I've just always been interested in Christianity and Judaism and and those and the ancient cultural context that, that gave rise to it. It's impossible now for me to separate out my academic stuff from, from the stuff I talk about publicly in terms of the ways in which religion can be incredibly damaging. And I think religion has... Um, had this privileged position in lots of our societies that needs reining in. Um, on the other hand, religion isn't going anywhere. I think there is something, um, you know, people worry about the decline of religion. There's no decline in religion. It's just that the, the, for, the forums and contexts in which religious practices and ideas are played out are just shifting. They're shifting away from sort of establishment um, contexts. And there's, there's a power shift that's going on within those those contexts too, which is interesting to look at as an outsider. But religion isn't going anywhere. I think there's something fundamentally about not just the human condition, because I think there are certain species of animals that highly social groups like elephants and chimps, where there seems to be some evidence. You know, look at look at them performing what looks to be mortuary and mourning rituals. Um, I think highly social animals like humans we have this huge capacity to imagine the otherworldly whether it's imagining that we have an ongoing relationship with our dead or whether it's imagining that there are there is a god or whatever it might be and i think for that reason i think it's it's hardwired into into us as highly social animals we're always going to have this otherworldly dimension in our lives so religion isn't going anywhere so i think part of what i do it isn't just to say that you know to talk about my atheism or to, to talk about um, what the Bible really says, <laughs> what, the, what the Bible really says when people are using the Bible particularly to hurt and damage and cause violence to others. Um, but it's also to, to, to make the case as well that A, religion is important and we need to keep talking about it. And even if we are a supposedly secular society or, you know, we, you know, we adhere to sort of secularist values and positions like, like that, religion isn't going and we need to be able to talk to each other about it and to understand each other but also 
as I said, I, I really do not see, I am not of the Dawkins kind of mould of atheist, which I think is, A, misunderstands religion, and B, has been very heavily freighted with certain sorts of gendered and socioeconomic assumptions and privileges that I find deeply troubling. Um, but also, was I on A, B, C, but also it's it's very bullying. And I think it's been very, um, and I don't like bullies. And I think that some atheists are ha- have bullied those who are religious. And I, I don't like bullies full stop. So, um, so that's for that reason. I think it's important also to step in and and say, well, actually, that's not my atheism, and just because I don't believe in in you know this otherworldly being that you believe in, doesn't mean to say that I think that you are somehow stupid or unsophisticated or you know I I don't think that's the case at all. There are lots of different ways of being in the world, um, and the most you know, as long as you're not hurting other people then so what? I don't I don't care what you think or believe. You know, as long as you as long as you're not hurting anyone and someone's not bullying you or hurting you, then yeah, it doesn't matter. But it's important to talk about it. I was saddened to read that you basically get a lot of or have at points in which we got a lot of oh, being a woman in the public eye, uh, mm. <laughs> abuse and like comments on what you look like and yeah. One, I just want to say I'm really sad that you've dealt with a lot of toxicity. What are the practices or positions or things in your life that help you build resilience and find places of meaning and belonging and insert whatever word feels right for you for spirituality, <laughs> you know, well-being mm. or whatever, that when you're, whether you're dealing with like toxic backlash to something you've said in public or just life in general? What do you, what do you do? How do you, in my language, I talk about like settling my soul. What do Mm. you do to like steady yourself? It depends because some of the really horrible stuff, um, you know, like a lot of the very violent threats and pornography that's been sent to me and all that kind of stuff, that's quite hard to deal with. Um, And one way I deal with it is I'm, I'm completely private on Facebook. So Twitter is my kind of public thing I don't mind who I talk to on Twitter but you know Facebook tends to be for my mates my family um academic colleagues and stuff so often I'll just post on Facebook because that's a way of exercising it um I'll say I'll do a screenshot and say this completely random stranger has just emailed this to me or sent this to me or tweeted me or whatever and look at this horrible stuff and then everybody else my mates on Facebook get protective and get angry on my behalf. But that's almost become like one of my little coping mechanisms, I guess. A little pressure valve. Yeah. And then that does kind of exercise it. It takes away that power. Because also when someone's emailing you, I mean, because obviously, you know, as an academic, my email is public. Like you can look me up on the university website and there's my email address. And, you know, people can send me, you know, people send me pornographic material to my workplace, um, you know, and saying various things about that I'm should burn in hell and I'm of witch and all this kind of stuff and and I think there's a certain kind of power that comes that somebody that the people that are doing that whether they're sending you a private message um you know as an email or sending you something or tweeting you directly or whatever it is that there's a power in doing that because they know they're getting right to you and if I don't tell anybody or keep it to myself even if I ignore it or whatever that's somehow allowing that power to 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 stay to, to hold and I'm not willing to do that. So I make it public. So by saying, somebody sent me this horrible email today. Here's a screenshot of it. Um, um you know, assholes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How and then other people say, yes, assholes. Yeah, and you feel exactly. a bit better. Yeah, and you do feel a bit better. But because I've also made it public, I've taken away the power from that, you know, the, potent- the potency of it as being just a one-on-one communication. And that helps me. And in terms of like the sort of things that I I research and study and write about, I'm very interested in the way that certain sorts of practices, certain things that you do, actions you take can alter power dynamics. Um, so actually, that's probably one of my little kind of rituals in, in some ways. So with the, dealing with that kind of horrible stuff. But I seem to be this kind of lightning rod in some ways for given what I talk about because of my specialism in what I teach and research and write about um, because of my atheism, because I'm a woman. Um, 
it, it's almost like it's, I'm a bit of a lightning rod for certain sorts of misogynistic elements of society, which and a misogyny that's very much bound bound up with certain religious um, preferences or traditional interpretations of texts. Or and so I think that does make it quite difficult. But you know, the kind of abuse I get is nothing compared to the sorts of abuse that that other women get, women of colour, for example. Um, so you know, I think you've got to remind yourself that you do but also that sh- I just I I can't apologize on behalf of Christians because that seems ridiculous <laughs> but I like from a tradition where the words of Jesus have been so strongly used in peace building movements and reconciliation movements and in the ability to have people to to disagree with others without lashing out for that to be where that's all coming from I'm just really ashamed and I'm really sorry like but it's not I mean the thing is but it's but it's this it's a part it's a broader part of this bullying isn't it that we find in in all aspects of I mean and seeing that it I don't know it feels like it's worse at the moment doesn't it you know think about the way that Donald Trump was you know when he was president the sort of was still still the way he behaves it's that bullying and intimidation we see it in a lot of the debates that are going on at the moment in terms of trans rights and I just there's there you know Yes, there's a middle ground and there's reasonable debate and discussion about whatever it might be, politics or gender or whatever. But you, there are always people on either ends of the extreme who who end up bullying and being aggressive and violent. And I think um, I think it's a part and parcel of that. So I, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. There's, there's this very human tendency, isn't there, to lash out? Yeah. And to feel very tribal, I think, that, you know, someone disagrees with me, they are other... I must fight rather than, mm. huh, that's interesting. I wonder why they think that. <laughs> Let's go find yeah. out. It, it, and particularly, I think, when there's, I'm um, doing some work with an organisation called Larger, Larger Us, which is looking at the kind of collective trauma responses of a world that you can argue about whether it objectively is less safe. It certainly is messaged as less safe. And so we all go into this kind of fight or flight defensive protect mm. my identity against everyone else reaction and um, I'm always very interested in ways that we choose something choose something different well my question is if you had to be a religion <laughs> if you had to become <laughs> religious of all the ones you've studied like the ancient cults modern paganism the cult of Zeus you know um Mm. What what would it be really as a as a way of sort of testing my thesis about the things that matter to you and the things that um, mm. energize you? It was absolutely hands down be an ancient polytheistic religion. Absolutely, I think religion is about being. Um, you know, Judaism and Christianity are post biblical religions. Um, Islam, obviously, too, and. And because of the impact of certain sorts of philosophical, primarily platonic, um, but not only, but primarily platonic philosophical distinctions drawn between the mind and the body or the soul and the body or whatever it is, um, I think the body has been diminished hugely within those particular traditions. But the fact is, we are our bodies. We are not set, We are not living in our, we're not dwelling in our bodies. Our bodies are not vessels or containers for some other sense of, of, for us or ourselves. We are our bodies. And it's by means of our bodies that we, that we are, that, 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 we, you know, that we, that we exist, we socialize. And it's the sociality of the body that's really, always has really interested me in terms of religions. Is, you know, that's what I mean. It's what we do, what we eat, who we have sex with, who we don't have sex with, how we, you know, all of that stuff. Um, and for that reason, it is about, it's, it's the sociality of religions that most interests me. And one of the big things that Christianity has tried to, um, that has, I think, theologically it struggles with, is the notion of one God. And yet, this is a, a divine that is made up of a numerous different sorts of persons, as they're called in theological tradition. Um because, yeah, you need groups. We are communities. And I really like polytheistic. I really like polytheistic systems, which are very much about households of deities, communities of deities. And they fight and they fall out. Yes. And they have sex and they do. And, but, but they, they are, um, much more alive to me than <laughs> this kind of sense of this immaterial, incorporeal, solitary otherness that, 
you know, it's really hard to have a relationship with an abstract. And um, I'd much rather have, if I was to have any kind of religious relationship, I would much rather have relationships with these different sort of collection, a host of different deities um, who are all having relationships with one another as well. I think it's just much more interesting and exciting. <laughs> delightful. Thank you for on uh, humouring my question. And uh, <laughs> Francesca Stavrakopoulou, thank you so much for speaking to me on The Sacred. Thank you for having me. So the first thing to say about this interview is that I was really not looking forward to it. And I feel okay saying that here because I said it to Francesca (laughs) during the interview. So it hopefully won't be a surprise to her. But I come to every interviewee who I don't already know with a bag of assumptions and prejudices, basically. Um in the way I think we all do just because we need cognitive shortcuts and we can't um, pay attention of the fullness to the fullness of a human being in public life. And so we just get kind of signifiers, oh, you're this kind of person, you're that kind of person, you're my kind of person, you're not my kind of person. And it was particularly challenging me for me with Francesca because all I really knew of her is that she is a kind of public high-profile atheist. And I had got her actually in the box of a sort of Dawkins-type atheist. So it is helpful for me to hear her say very clearly that's not her type of atheism. Um, And also because her book, her most recent book, God and Anatomy, is, you know, very rigorous and well-researched book, but is very clearly coming from, you know, Jews and Christians have have read the Bible wrong or have interpreted the Bible wrong. And it really, it really touched a nerve with me um, in the way that these things always do when someone clearly disagrees with something that's very deep in us, that's very close to our identity. And I found myself feeling quite shirty (laughs) as I was preparing for this interview. Um, And realizing how much cultural programming I have around what you do in those situations, which is you try and win. You try and have, you know, the best arguments and you try and prove someone wrong and you try and catch them out and have aha moments. And this is embarrassing to admit. I hope I'm not the only one. I hope you recognize it. But um, it's not the first time it's happened in preparing for an interview, but I felt it most noticeably in this because on lots of other markers we have loads in common and you know as you will hear I really liked it and we got on really well and it was a, a really lovely conversation in the moment of encounter but I could tell how that sense of my deep sacred things being transgressed was putting me into not a very open posture not a very human posture not a very good posture for listening I actually had to call in some help and ask for some people to pray for me and <laughs> give myself talking to um but it, this is a kind of example of the journey that I have been on with many, many, many of these interviews with going into a conversation with someone with a set of expectations about who they are and coming out with a very different picture, a much fuller picture and the discipline of not going in, immediately putting them in an adversarial position by going on the attack, um, but just sitting um, with curiosity it's just, it's, it's really powerful. It's really powerful for people like me who are, have deep, unlovely parts of myself and natural judgy tendencies. Um, even to the extent that this is embarrassing to admit, and I might cut it out. But as I was researching her, I realized Francesca had been to private school. And so I was like, well, you know, of course, part of her atheism is sort of from a privileged intellectual class. Um, and that obviously story was complexified for me and revealed to me my own prejudices and just so much of my own nonsense. So that's my overarching reflection from this conversation. What a lovely woman. Um, what a what an intelligent, self-reflective person and what a joy to meet her, even though on something very deep and important to both of us, we are poles, poles apart. And actually, you know, as well as giving myself talking to and getting some friends to pray for me, the thing that really switched it was reading about the abuse she'd received and recognizing much 
much less serious instances of that kind of thing that I've received, like weird comments on my appearance of either 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 caring too much about my appearance or not caring enough about my appearance as a woman in in public life. Just my appearance being public property in a way that it very much is in the abuse that Francesca receives. Um, but also in that sense of that just shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen to anyone. Um, and, and that really helped me change my really dodgy attitude <laughs> as I was going into this interview. I think that's all I want to say. She seems absolutely lovely and I hope we get to hang out more. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Sacred. Remember, sharing is caring, as my four-year-old says, so please do send this or another episode to a friend, rate us on Apple Podcasts, or my personal favourite, leave us a review. I really get a thrill when I see a new one pop up. Huge thanks to Abby Allison for research and production support, and Emily Down for our visual identity. We are edited by Drew Hawley, and our music is composed and arranged by Luke Stanley, with vocals by Lizzie Harvey. The Sacred is a project of the think tank Theos, and you can find out more about our work at theosthinktank.co.uk.